Uh, well, you would not better. Yes, I yeah. just, the only one, yeah. All right, so everybody hopefully is back. Let me just get out of the way here. So it's uh, my honor to introduce uh, my friend, uh, Yosef, Professor Yosef Kusak from University of Zagreb. Um, those of you that came last night heard me uh, say some things, um, and uh, very happy that he is here. Um, I'm going, you guys all have to go and watch, uh, normally I, I give a lecture on international conservation, but uh, it's kind of weird semester of the semester, not, not going to do that. Um, so instead, I'm going to have you guys watch some of our podcasts from Turkey. And I have many more I need to post up, which show him ha uh, teaching you how to put up wolf traps and all that kind of good stuff. Don't have those up yet, but I do have one where we had a, a road-killed wolf. And you can see uh, Yosef describing, walking you through the necropsy and stuff like that. Um, uh, so we first met in Turkey this past uh, about nine months ago, and uh, with my Turkish conservation project, which began with a, a simple sort of effort to just inventory the biodiversity of the site, of this part of Turkey, it sort of grew, and it grew. Now we have restorations and sustainable development and ecotourism, and one of the things we've wanted to add for a long time, and we're very pleased that Yosef is, has come to join us, is a component looking at the large... Uh, animals, the bears, the, the wolves, and all that kind of good stuff. And we, we did a little bit beforehand, last couple of years, did some surveys of villagers and things of that nature, but um, Yosef was kind enough to come and train our Turkish technicians how to trap wolves safely and how to um, uh, uh, help us monitor them with, with uh, GPS collars and things of that nature. And so if you missed last night's seminar, that will be up soon, and you can watch that. That's primarily about his work in Croatia, but it's very interesting and very applicable to many different uh, areas. And, um, and we had a great conversation, we had a great time when we were in, in Turkey, and we, we share a lot of interests in things like roadkill and fragmentation and stuff like that. So uh, since he was so kind to come all the way across from, from Europe to come visit us and give a uh, departmental seminar, I said, you must talk to my students about fragmentation and landscape connectivity and all that kind of good stuff. And so he's, he's uh, been kind enough to do that. And so um, uh, I should also say that uh, Professor Kusak uh, began as an undergrad at University of Zagreb. And then just like some of you guys are volunteering in my lab with other professors, he, he started working on projects as an undergrad, got really interested, kept working, stayed for his master's on bears. That was cool, did that. Then uh, continued to work, transferred in... in came to the U.S. to become trained on how to track wolves and capture wolves and safely, safely uh, work with wolves, and then went back and did his Ph.D. on wolves, and now is a professor in that university. His, his, his mentor, his professor, is about what, another couple years going to retire. Yep. So he's sort of become a student, and now he's become the master. So he <laughs> sees the pebble from the master's hand. So uh, without further ado, this is Professor Yosef Kusak. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Sean. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, let's go. Lower that a little teeny bit just for that. Ah. It's a little better. Good. Well, I'm going to show you or to tell you. Well, thank you for coming and uh, for your attention. <laughs> um, I'm really pleased that I have opportunity to show you this uh, story. Actually, it's a story which covers some 20 years of. Uh, some issues developing in Croatia and uh, what we have done regarding uh, linear infrastructures, mainly roads and uh, railroads, which were being built and uh, which still exist, well, which now exist, and uh, how we manage and to some degree to mitigate the uh, potential threat of uh, habitat fragmentation for large carnivores in Croatia. And uh, I hope that uh, what we'll, we have learned on our own uh, experience, uh, might help uh, elsewhere to yeah, well, somehow to solve the similar issues. Yeah, let's see. Just an introduction like yesterday for those who didn't have a chance to see. Uh, Croatia is a very small country in southeastern Europe, which is uh, between the Slovenia, Hungary, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Serbia, 
has a very strange shape, like a bird. And this is, the, and this is actually the consequence of uh, history. In, in the 10th century, Croatians were living. There was a Croatian kingdom which also involved, included the whole Bosnia. But since the Ottoman invasion, Turkish invasion, Turks. Yeah, Turks from the east, they were pushing from the east and the people, people were chased to the west and they, this is the, as, as far they came. Actually, this was for 500 years the border between the Ottoman Empire and uh, Europe, the battle line. So, we lost part of the, well, I should not suppose, but here I can say in Croatia, it's not <laughs> politically correct to say that this has to be Croatia again. It cannot be, but it's now Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is uh, settled by Serbian nationality. They were pushed from the east by Croatians who left there, and also by descendants of Turks or Ottomans who came there and stayed to live there. So, Muslims yeah, today. However, that's the history. Let's go to the present. Croatia has a size of five. 56,000 square kilometers. I have learned uh, recently from Sean that this is like two of your counties, like Ventura County and uh, which county? San Santa, Santa Barbara. Maybe Ventura, together. Santa Barbara yeah, okay. So, relatively small country for your standards, but uh, it's rather diverse. We have a lowlands here, which is mostly agricultural. This, what is green, is forest. But all what is not green is uh, agricultural fields. We have some hilly area here and higher mountains along the uh, stretch from uh, northwest to southeast. And those mountains are not really high, maybe 1,700, 1,800 meters maximum. And they are mostly covered with forest. And there are three different regions which we can di uh, distinguish in this area. And there is a coast with more than 800 islands, very nice islands. And the coast is very uh, windy, diverse. It's about 1,000 kilometers long. Inland is nice, but most of the tourists who come to Croatia, they go to the coast. So they see, they go to islands or to the mainland along the shore. They can go anywhere with boats and so there are many nice places to be seen, especially in the southern part of Adriatic. And uh, immediately after the coast, there are mountains which go steep up, up to more than 1,000 meters. And just on the other side, and now even on this coastal side, because the vegetation overgrew in the last 30, 40 years, there are very few people and also large carnivores living there in this nice forest. The area covers maybe 90% is covered with forest. Mixed deciduous forest like a beech and some other broadleaf plants and also fir is a dominant conifer. This is the area where we have large carnivores. This is the they are the subject of our study for the last uh, 30 years. First my mentor, Professor Juro Huber and later me and together with him, we and some other guys were studying those animals for the last 30 years since the early 90s, uh, 80s. 1981 was the first wolf bear. So, what is peculiar about these animals is that they need a lot of space and this space has to be continuous. Uh, Croatia was lucky to have a relatively large portion of the land covered with continuous forest. And that's why those animals have, were never extinct. They, there were periods where there was a rather low number of some of them, let's say bears were always on the higher number. Why was that? Bears are bigger, but still there could be more bears in the uh, certain area than what could be uh, wolves or lynx. And this is because they eat mostly plants. They are herbivores. Well, taxonomically they are carnivores, but Ecologically, they are 90% herbivores, so they need much less space than what c real carnivores will need, will, would need. However, it is inevitable that it c can hardly stay like this, you know. 
things are changing and roads are being built everywhere and Croatia also wanted to build roads recently and uh, the question is how to maintain the continuity of the habitat and to have a roads or in this case we call this highway what you call the highway uh, it's a, you call it interstate or I don't know uh, the road which has a fence that's the point you know from both sides so that the animals cannot go on the highway and uh, cannot be hit by cars uh, cause the accident die there and so the best road through the habitat is the one which does not exist yeah. so but this is not possible <laughs> so what else can you do look at the wider picture Western Europe has built their highways long ago and there are very very many of them Germany Austria France Spain a little bit less but okay, of course England all of them have so many roads that they have lost large carnivores long time ago and uh, this picture I mean uh, North America or United States would look pretty much the same yes. yeah. Or, yeah. So, not worse, but pretty much yeah maybe not, not that much but well it, it can be calculated yeah West is different yeah this is where you ha have the large portions of habitat which is well this eastern part is still Europe as, as you can see there are barely any highways Eastern Europe was uh, part of this Eastern Soviet Union block and it was not developing that fast luckily but it's also changing now anyway so these are areas where large carnivores still live this mountain range coming from Slovenia all the way to Croatia Bosnia Herzegovina all the way to Greece and to Bulgaria and there's another mountain range mountain chain called Carpathian mountains these are strongholds of large carnivores in Europe if we don't count further to the south to, the, to Russia yeah, this uh, European part of Russia and our Scandinavia but we don't see it on the picture they have a decent number of bears but not so many wolves or lynx however and situation in Western, uh, Eastern Europe is going to change but luckily it didn't happen yet so now we know better and we hope that we will do better than the Western <coughs> Europe that things will be done a little bit different than what was done before when the knowledge was not so nobody was thinking about continuity of habitat and how to preserve it well we couldn't really influence the whole Europe well to some extent we did because we were invited in Romania when they are planning the highway and to <coughs> Poland also to share the uh, knowledge and experience but I will just speak about the Croatia well highways are not always absolute barriers sometimes they don't build these fences very well and animals can find here and there some places where they can, can go under or sometimes even they can dig they really did in some cases this was done by wolves pack of wolves was kind of entered the highway uh, between two fences and managed to cross but and most of them managed to escape except one and that one was killed <coughs> one animal if it's killed it's not a problem but it's more a problem for uh, drivers and for a car if the car is destroyed and this car was really destroyed this, this is not the black wolf the wolf was be became black because of the oil which spilled from the car the car was also destroyed with this uh, crash or a case like this I have to start the video this is uh, a bad video from automatic camera on the highway when sometimes at night C 2254 a bear decided to cross bears can climb fence very easily this a brown bear we don't have black bears yeah well it's bad bad, bad video but you can see that something is moving and this is definitely a bear trust me uh, yeah it was lucky and uh, this was a female actually which decided to cross but there were two cups <laughs> in the dark here and then she they, they couldn't go they didn't follow her and then she decided to go back and uh, 
was not hit this time. So with bears, it's more difficult. They can <coughs> climb over the fence anywhere. They are very good climbers. And uh, if they find themselves on the highway, it's a problem for them and also for cars. So is that in a relatively this uh, is new. isolated place? Or is that well, actually, this is actually a very weird situation. The camera is just very close to the 800 meters long tunnel. But this bear uh, looking out of the tunnel. Yeah, yeah. didn't want to go over the tunnel. He just wanted to go there. <laughs> <laughs> so you cannot, bears are very individual. So if you get to know one individual, doesn't mean that you know all bears. <laughs> so however, at this time the bear survived. But some other times, bears were hit by traffic, by cars, also by trains. Uh, we have a statistic about dead bears like 40 years ago, or even 50 years in the past. And uh, when I started to work in 1992, this was my first task to do, to study mortality or road kills or railroad kills of bears in Croatia. There were records kept about the places where bears were killed by trains and by cars or trucks. And uh, we were interested how, what are circumstances of these events? Are there some places where bears got killed more often? And what are the features of those places? Let's say, are these uh, because of the less visibility or bears don't hear coming train or... Uh, we don't know, well, what was the reason why some places are more frequent uh, with uh, bear kills or bear accidents than others. So then I and another colleague, okay, comes later. So what is the problem with those structures, uh, roads, uh, railroads? Most obvious, what people, most people see is a direct mortality. Animals get killed or they get just disturbed. They are uh, chased away from their road. It's also pollution, which has many aspects, which we don't uh, easily see. And then it's a habitat fragmentation, which can have uh, various consequences on uh, movements of animals. So home ranges, you have heard yesterday a little bit about home ranges, those who were, can be shifted. If there is uh, some construction, some highway, railroad coming through, the animals have to move away. They cannot use this area anymore. Or home ranges, sizes of home ranges can be changed. The sizes can be, if the home range is cut, then they cannot go on the other side like they used to do it before. So they have to shrink to the smaller place. Or movement patterns can also be changed. So previously they were going all over the place and now they just go on the one side of the highway. And gene flow can be altered. So this means they cannot disperse freely, they cannot find the mate, they can, they should probably mate with closer relatives and uh, this can cause on the long term, long run, this can cause a problem. There are evidences about such uh, the consequence of uh, alter, altered gene flow uh, sometimes are called inbreeding. Well, this is when the animals breed in, uh, with close relatives. So brothers with sister, mothers with uh, uh, sons or offspring and so on. There is one small population of uh, red deer in, in Germany which was isolated for 70 years and now they see the consequence of inbreeding. This is a lower jaw of uh, deer which was shot. You see it's uh, much shorter than it should be. And another example, several animals from this small isolated population were showing uh, uh, evidences of inbreeding. It's not happening yet with uh, other animals, but uh, if we have a breeding with cross relatives for a long time, then this is what can happen. Or various different uh, anomalies. Yeah. So the best highway, if there is 
no chance that you can avoid building a highway is the one which has a viaduct, tunnel, viaduct, tunnel, da, da, da. So there, are, so that there are many options for animals to go from one side to another. Yeah. So of course, that such highway is very expensive. If you are going to build a viaduct and dig a tunnel, it's much easier to make a dike here, dig it and dump the material in the hole and make it flat and even in the highway can be easily built. So, but keeping in mind the need of, for connectivity, this is somehow something what is, uh, let's say, the ideal situation. If there is an inevitability of the highway construction. In Croatia, this is the map of Croatia, you see the lowlands, some hilly area here, and also hilly area here, and the mountainous area with some uh, flatland in between. This is the picture of high uh, road and railroad network for Croatia. But this is just the normal roads, two lanes roads and highways, uh, railroads, which doesn't have any fence. So this is not really an obstacle for the movement of animals. Animals can get killed on this, those uh, roads and railroads, but uh, they can, many of them will go through and they go wherever they want. The back was railroads? Yes. Well, there are not very many railroads, so just one going to the shore, one going to the south, and a few more in the lowlands. So, animals get killed on such uh, railroads and roads, and this is something what I was going to study in the early 90s. So, I put my backpack on and uh, had a map with all the places where bears were killed by train and by cars. I was actually walking all along the railroad and uh, measuring features of those places where bears were killed. What is the visibility on the left and the right, how far they could see along the railway, uh, what is growing, which kind of vegetation on the sides, uh, is it very steep or not. Where Describing the place, and also was uh, choosing randomly other places where animals were not killed, and measuring the same parameters and to c compare are there any differences. So that was really interesting work. What a great project for one of you guys <laughs> to your capstone. That was due to new project. Yeah. Uh, well. And also uh, the same thing on the roads, on the places where bear, uh, bears were killed. So that was my bear work at the very beginning. And even earlier than this uh, uh, mortality on the roads and railroad work, the, our project uh, started with my mentor, my professor. Uh, they were uh, tracking bears, doing a radio telemetry of bears. So over the year, they started in 1981. What was the first such a, a project in Europe, literally. And uh, over time, 37 different bears were tracked. For today's standard, this is not much, but at that time, it was really something. Very new, because we didn't know anything about movements of those animals. It was very precious knowledge. Later on, we started to track also wolves, and we tracked 27 wolves from different parts of Croatia, but mostly in the north, and seven lynx. This is the least studied uh, large carnivore in Croatia. Hopefully it will be improving in the future. It was a classical VHF telemetry with uh, antenna and a radio receiver. In the recent times it was uh, with GPS colors. And we collected uh, knowledge and published several papers about that. So we got to know, became aware of the need of a space for those animals and how they react on roads and railroads, why they are killed on roads. All this related to habitat and to connectivity, need for space. And somehow it was pure luck that highways were not yet built. So we had some almost 30 years time to study animals before the state government decided to build highways. So sometimes it's good not to be too advanced. <laughs> well, 
first highways were built in the 1960s, and this was in the lower part of Croatia. They were going, uh, stretching from uh, northwest to southeast. Um, this, uh, Croatia was that time part of uh, Yugoslavia, bigger country which consisted of six republics, and actually eastern republics were always behind a little bit economically, and it was political decision that they should be connected, you know. That's why the building of the highway to the east was politically correct, but when in the 70s we wanted a uh, Croatian government, local yeah, republic government, wanted to build the highway to the shore to connect the coast with the capital of Croatia, it was stopped. We built first 30 kilometers of the highway, and then they said, okay, no more highway, no money for that. And for 30 years, it stayed like this. And if you remember the distribution of large carnivores, the highway just came close to the range of large carnivores. So they live here in the mountains, but for the next 30 years, there was no any highway construction in this area. And we were doing study there in the meantime. So only after the war and break apart from Yugoslavia, Croatia managed to build more highways. And the first one was to connect this town, this place here, with the uh, uh, coast. And this highway was going through the, was cutting the range of large carnivores in the direction east-west. A few years later, we built another very, very much longer highway connecting from this point all the way to this big towns, well, relatively, to the south, split, and here further south to Dubrovnik town. So this is, was important for the touristic reasons yeah, to have a good highway to, so that the tourists can go to the coast here, just they make one small they exit here or here or here, and they are already at the coast. So now it's really important for the uh, economy of Croatia. And you see this highway was also cutting the large carnivore range in much longer, longer uh, section. So, how did this construction affect the continuity of habitat? At the first glance, it looks very bad. When you see the highway which has a fence and the forest was cut, like the habitat was divided in two pieces. But actually, if you take a closer look, it's not that bad. Luckily, these are all mountains. The first highway, the northern one, which was built 10 years ago, it had numerous, these black patches are uh, tunnels, viaducts, uh, or bridges. And altogether, on this section of 68 kilometers of highway, there is like 44 different uh, structures, which are altogether 17 kilometers wide or long along the highway, which consists, which uh, brings 25% uh, of total permeability of the highway. And plus this, on this particular spot, there is one additional green bridge, we call it, green bridge, where there was, by the planning of the highway, nothing anticipated, but they asked uh, us for opinion when the highway was planned, should we build something somewhere for the animals to cross? And we were looking at the plan and knowing all what, uh, yeah, it looks very idealistic, right? But it was like this, really. Uh, the highway was planned and they asked us from the faculty who work with uh, bears, at that time it was bears mostly, is there anything else needed for this highway before the construction? And we said, well, we think on this particular place it would be good to have a green bridge. And they did it. The same story was on the highway leading to the south, to Split and to Dubrovnik. See, much longer. Along this highway, there are also numerous uh, <laughs> possibilities for crossing, planned. Uh, uh, tunnels, viaducts, the same. And... Uh, the highway is like 250 kilometers long and altogether has 113 uh, crossing structures which then bring the 10% of uh, total permeability 
for the whole highway section. As you can see here on the south in Dalmatia, the highway is going relatively close to the coast and this is not uh, overgrown with the forest and very close. Uh, here, the density of this crossing structure is not very high, but it's also not so important because there is not much habitat here lost. This is already developed and uh, people live there and so it's not a big deal. But here, all along the northern part, it's very important because this is very good habitat, very nice mountain called Velebit, like a big mountain. And also here, it doesn't seem to be very yeah, much forested, but there are some patches of forest and this is the area where we have a, there is one uh, nature park here and one bigger mountain here. So, and this is the area where wolves live. So no, we were actually evaluating the whole uh, planned uh, uh, route of the highway. But, but I mean, but I mean the uh, we didn't underpass they were already going to put in. Yes, they would give us the plans what they are going to do. And we would evaluate and we would suggest. It was not just the green bridges. They All along this highway, there were 10 additional green bridges built. But sometimes we didn't ask for a green bridge. Sometimes it was enough to ask for, a, let's say, they were going to bury one hole. And they would say, OK, don't do it. Instead of this, uh, leave it uh, as a hole and put a viaduct on top of it. So the highway is on the, in the air. Mm -hmm. So I didn't uh, specifically so list. Viaduct, we call overpass. OK, overpass, yeah. Like, well, bridge is when there is a river under. Uh, and then uh, a viaduct is only when it's a dry uh, hole under the hi uh, highway. Yeah. So there are some other which I didn't specifically list here, but we would suggest for several places, OK, build a viaduct, build a, or widen it, make it longer, make it uh, deeper. And usually they would accept. But there are also 10 additional green bridges built all, all along these 250 kilometers of uh, highway. I will tell you one story about one place which is very important to me personally. This was my first study area for wolves in Dalmatia. This is split town. If you look at the Google, you will see it's the biggest town in southern part of Croatia. There is one mountain ridge and immediately after the that ridge, there are wolves, or used to be. Well, there are still wolves, don't worry. Uh, this is where I started to study wolves in uh, late uh, 90s, 1998. We were doing telemetry, collected a lot of uh, locations of wolves. There were two different packs living in this area. There was one valley here, which was called Vucevica Valley. Vucevica, uh, in Croatian language, uh, a word for a uh, wolf is a vuk. It was like a wolf valley. It was very wild, uh, uninhabited, uh, nice oak forest growing. And this was the place where wolves liked, liked to stay. And I was spending three years there tracking wolves. And one day, I saw some sticks driven into the soil with some red on the top. I was asking, what is this? I didn't know at first. And then finally I found out that this is the plan, this is the route, these are markings where the future highway will be. <laughs> but a bad <laughs> finding. And, uh, and so, so just so you guys make sure we understand, so those are the latitude and longitude of a collar signal of a, of a wolf. So yeah, these are points where the animals were yeah. based on the telemetry. Over the three years tracking them. So we found out that the highway is going to be put right there. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Just through the wolf uh, area and uh, cutting the habitat into pieces and taking uh, pieces of the land. Yeah. Where they just here where is a uh, large density of dots. This is where they had a den in previous years. 
So well, uh, but for this part of the highway, they actually didn't ask us to do any study or, or evaluation of the impact. But we went to them, to the company which was uh, planning the highway. And asked them, okay, uh, we know that highway is going to be built, but uh, can we somehow suggest uh, some improvements, what should be done uh, to prevent uh, habitat fragmentation, and because there are wolves, and wolves are protected in Croatia, you know. And they said, well, okay, here are our plans for this uh, section of the highway, so you can write what you think. And we did. Well, first we asked that they should put highway on the other side of the mountain, here. But they didn't accept it. They said, oh, no, no way, we have to put it here. Here are some private lands, and they would have to buy it uh, from people, and here is a uh, national land, and they no problems with that uh, ownership. Was that a national park, or what? No, nothing. It was just a forest, forest managed by forestry, local forestry. And uh, then we analyzed the highway and find out that there will be some tunnels. Here will be one 800 meters tunnel, there will be one viaduct. But we also suggested to build two additional viaduct, or three additional viaducts in the places where they didn't plan to build them, and also to build a, another one, green bridge there. So to improve the connectivity. Here the situation was not so bad, there was one underpass, 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 tunnel, so they could, the wolves presumably would be able to cross. Well, the problem is, in all this planning, it came all of a sudden, there was no any uh, suggestion, no regulations, no laws about this. We actually didn't know how much permeability is needed how often, how frequent these uh, crossing possibilities should be. It was like best guess, actually, based on, of course, based on the previous knowledge, what we had about the movements of those animals and needs for space. But there was no any official recommendation or rules to follow how to, what to suggest, yeah. Just hoping that we will, we will, uh, are, we will uh, guess it right. And also, how wide these crossing structures should be. Uh, they would say, okay, we will be, build 25 meters overpass or 50 meters maximum. And we said, no, no, we want 400 meters, we want 300 <laughs> meters. And then we would bargain, bargain, and then we would come to the agreement somewhere 100 meters, 150 meters, and the longest one, 200 meters, was built right here. Why? Well, I asked for 300. Right, but, but, but you don't mean, you say length, you mean... Yeah, you mean the width, yeah, width, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, the width, if you look from the perspective of, of the animal which has to pass to cross it, so 300, 200 meters wide for, an, for them, if you look from the perspective of the highway, for the cars who drive under, it's like length of the tunnel through which they drive is 200 meters. I don't believe conservation biologists guessing about something. I don't <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they started to build it. No, really, uh, uh, there was no rules how many, how often, and how wide they should be. And what year is this? This was uh, the first Green Bridge uh, in, in uh, 1998 or 7. When they start to build, it's a lot of mess, a lot of disturbance on this place. But anyway, even then, you see this is the construction site. These are tracks of bears. The bear came to the edge of the construction. It's like was waiting. Come on, let's go. I would like to go on the other side. Hurry up. Yeah. So they build it. Basically, there were two different types of uh, those uh, overpasses ones which would be with two separate tubes for each uh, two lanes in one tube and two lanes in the other. And uh, this was built in the places where they planned to put a lot of soil on top of it so that such construction is much stronger and they can uh, hold much uh, thicker layer of soil. Even the trees can grow on top of it. Yeah. 
at that time we were on this northern section uh, contracted by the company to be uh, engineers which are responsible for supervising the construction of those uh, green bridges and we would say we would come every now and then to see how these things are being done for example for, from their perspective or from the perspective of uh, builders of the highway this was a very good they made it nice flat like a playground without any stones without any vegetation and they said is it okay I said no 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 not okay <laughs> you have to make it uneven you have to put rocks on it it has to look like the neighboring area you have to plant trees on top of it and they did it this is the same place after one month later so they they put a lot of stones they they planted trees which grow around and they were even watering them during summer and those we also suggested that they have to close the access roads uh, which were used for the construction during uh, uh, when the trucks were going to the place so they also closed the roads this is the other type of uh, green bridge which is like a one arch so it cannot hold so much uh, soil on top but it can be this is all in the time when it was still fresh there was no any vegetation but with time the vegetation will grow and it will be much greener so but no, but no only trees probably in the on the edges yeah on the edges yeah yeah and well it don't go so into details there, there there should be also a, a how you, how you call it yeah screen yeah that's so that the animals don't see the uh, lights of the cars or the the noise is reduced and so this is now aerial picture of the place where the first green bridge was built you see there is one tunnel here like 800 meters long or wide if you look from the animal perspective but anyway this place where we put the green bridge was considered important how we knew about it why we did decided to put the green bridge there because here is the old road and this was the main road from the uh, capital to the coast during the uh, over the years several bears were exactly here killed by 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 cars so we knew so okay, they are going over this ridge they have to go here and here is also a railroad there were some bears were also killed here on the railroad that's why how we knew that really this place is good for them to cross they have to have something on this spot when the highway will be built so actually the mortality which we studied before was good uh, argument to place the highway uh, crossing structure but also we wanted once the construction was done we wanted to know we wanted to do monitoring what Sean was telling you uh, a company highway company was obliged to fund and still is to, to fund the monitoring of those crossing structures and we told them you should put the sand bed on the green bridge should put these concrete tubes with small holes where we can put these uh, infrared sensors inside so the sensor will count uh, the crossings and uh, on the top of this we will put automatic cameras on uh, crossing structures so we will monitor which animals and how often what time of the day are using and if they are using now that's the big moment now we will see if we did it right will we choose the right spots or not yeah and uh, we were periodically <laughs> periodically checking these uh, sand beds uh, reading tracks putting them in a notebook later in a computer we were downloading data from infrared sensors and uh, from cameras of course scraping their sand later on to erase the tracks sometimes it would it would not work let's say during the winter when the those holes would be blocked and all the sensors would be covered with snow but still we could read tracks you see that in our area bears are not always sleeping even in the winter some of them move around and it's not like this uh, uh, green bridges uh, were not just places where the bears or other animals would just cross as fast as possible look around nobody is there let's go no they really felt like they are inside their habitat because here one bear was digging for wasps 
for nests of what for larves, or was living as cat, or was actually uh, sc scratching his uh, um, back, marking the place with, on this tree. The tree was almost destroyed, but there were a lot of hairs of a bear on it. See, and this is all happening very close to the Greenbridge. How many, how many years after the construction did you see that? Is it a month? Or well, I would have to check, but so here is very green, so it's a few years later. Exactly. Yeah. We were also checking uh, other crossing structures which were not specifically built for animals to cross, like tunnels, which were built because there was a mountain, so the highway had to go under. We were go also going to read and search for tracks on such places. And we also found evidences of animals living there, like uh, another digging of a bear just above the tunnel. And we put that automatic camera, camera on this, such places as well and uh, took pictures. There are also quantitative data, which I will not show later. And we found some differences. Let's say one tunnel was rather much uh, used by carnivores, let's say 29% of bear, 2% of wolf, 2% of leeks, and herbivores, some percentage, while the other tunnel, not far from the previous one, was much less used by carnivores and more by herbivores. So there are some differences. While the viaduct, this is what I call viaduct, you see the highway is on the high uh, columns, and uh, there is nothing, no river, but just dry ground or meadow below. This meadow was very much used by roe deer. Roe deer was not just, uh, they were not just passing, they were really grazing in this place. So this was really nice to see and document. And altogether, this is a very large table, but just these numbers on the bottom shows you how many animals per day in 24 hours were using the green bridge, like 15.7 crosses in 24 hours. Uh, another, this was a viaduct, 4.26, one tunnel, 11, and the other tu tunnel, 37 crossings in... in that, that's a year average across the This year? is daily, yeah, yeah over the uh, period of monitoring of several years, daily, yeah. And this just represents three or four different uh, crossing structures. We didn't monitor all of them. But it's showing how important and how frequent these uh, overpasses are for the animals. And if we take a closer look on the green bridge on Dedin, this first green bridge, we found out that the middle section, it was divided in three sections, middle section was used more than the side sections. This is indicating that uh, it is really important that these crossing structures are wide enough. So if they are too narrow, then the animals are trying to avoid edges, trying to avoid uh, noisy traffic, which they can hear on lights at night. So they try to squeeze to the middle section where they don't hear it that much. So it's really for large animals like bears or other large mammals, it is important that these overpasses would be wide enough and how wide it should be are Opinion is that 100 meters is minimum. So more is better. Daily use of those, those crossing structures, mostly during the night and morning, but during the afternoon, much less. Yeah. They try to go during the less, in the, during the period where the human presence is less expected. Oh, was that species specific? No, well, uh, this is for all together, yeah. Right. But, but some, some prefer to move at night and some in day, or... Uh, does anybody prefer to move in day, or no? No, no. You will see later why day is not good. So we also did telemetry tracking of wolves and bears and lynx in the same area where there was a highway. So, one study area, but multiple use of our work. So this is a picture which shows the home ranges of several bears and wolves and lynx in the highway area. And you clearly see, can see that some animals, like this bear, or no, this was a wolf, was using 
both sides and another bear was also using both sides. Well, a little bit, you have to take a closer look to see really which, is, which animal is which. But uh, showing another picture, movement of just one bear, one animal, shows you how much it was using some of the crossing structures. There, this was a one tunnel, this was another tunnel. And many times that the bear was, has crossed the, the highway, I remember like 41 times in one year period. And also, it moved, here is the green bridge which we designed uh, for the crossing of, of bears. It, in the autumn of the year when it was tracked, he decided to go to the northeast in the lower area where there's uh, some abandoned villages and a lot of orchards, like uh, plums growing there and uh, pears, uh, such kind of fruits. It was spending three months there feeding on those uh, fruits. And then before denning, it went the same way over the green bridge here in the mountainous area where they uh, usually den. It's also showing how nicely this green bridge was useful for that animal. The highway going to the south was also monitored by the uh, same method, like uh, infrared sensors, cameras, and also movement of some of the bears. This is, by the way, Juro Huber, this my supervisor. He likes to put collars on bears. <laughs> uh, we tracked several bears, uh, but this area is a bit different. Uh, there, it's more wilder from the terms of human attitude toward the large carnivores. Uh, they like to shoot them. This bear, young female, was tracked for only three months, and he was rather close to the highway, but she didn't even have a chance to cross. Somehow she didn't find This was a green bridge. She didn't find it because she was killed before nearby the highway. So by, so on the highway Illegally killed. Illi not by the highway. Poached. Yeah, we found the collar which was cut off. Yeah. Well, on the other places, automatic cameras have also mon uh, recorded wolves, foxes, all kinds of animals using those overpasses. And the infrared ah. is just a double check on the camera? Yeah, it's like this. Uh, first, we had only infrared and sand bed. Cameras came later. So, we were using a sand bed to read the tracks to get the ratio of species. While infrared sensor, they just give you the total number. So we were applying the ratio to the total number of crossing. And people never lost over the Wait. <laughs> oh, when we started to use cameras, okay, I will tell you, this, some of these overpasses on the highway to the south, to Split and Dubrovnik, they were a little bit less used than the northern highway, about 10. 10 crossings per 24 hours on average. Um, but also, we have to be aware that the density of large mammals in this area is lower than in the northern part. And when we analyze the daily use, we saw a peak in the middle of the day, completely different than on the northern highway. So that's weird, kind of, yeah? So why is that? Well, the automatic cameras gave the answer. Because during the day, people are active, and they use these green bridges. This is a logging tractor, or guys driving a motorcycle nicely there, or foresters with their forestry cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these overpasses are really very convenient to go from one side of the highway to another, not only for animals, but for everyone. So what can you do? And these are hunters checking tracks on the sand bed, and even hunting, because the, the green beach is like a funnel. The animals from wider area, which they want to cross, they go to that place and they go on the other side. And they learned that this is a good place for hunting. Yeah, they come with dogs and uh, guns. And also domestic animals, only dogs or cows in the area. This is in Dalmatia, this highway is in Dalmatia. There is a lot of livestock there. So the local people also use them for daily crossing to the other side, to the pastures. Yeah, you see this. Did people understand so, at first that those were actually cameras? Or they didn't know? No, they didn't pay attention. But later on, some cameras were stolen and, and so on, or just uh, taped. They put the tape over the sensor and stuff. So. 
And then we decided we have to have a law about this. It's not just enough to have an overpass and hoping that it, everything will be okay. So we made the bylaws to the nature conservation law, which says, well, there are many other things, but basically these are the main, most important things. You, know, you see that we distinguished two different uh, categories of overpasses, like or crossing structures, up to 300 meters wide and more than 300 meters wide. <coughs> On this shorter or narrower 300 meters, we de declared that any human activity is prohibited. So nobody should go there whatsoever. And wider, like long tunnels, we have some tunnels which are 5,000 meters wide, two such tunnels. This is over the big mountains and there, there is a forest and uh, nobody even knows that there is a highway below. So it would not be good that if somebody builds a ski resort area on top of the mountain where there is a highway below. So this ordinance actually is prescribing rules that it should not be done. Well, one thing is just to make a law and the other is to apply it. First thing what we did after that is to put signs that this is a crossing structure from the side of the road so that the drivers, this is more like a advertising, here is a crossing structure that everybody knows. But most important is uh, to put a sign on the side of the, uh, above the crossing structure where the animals are coming so that those people who come by cars, by on foot, hunters and so, that they are aware that this is not uh, area where they should go. Well, of course, signs don't mean much. They will anyway go. So what could you do? At least to prevent cars coming, you can dig a hole, dig a ditch, and uh, make the road inaccessible to the Green Bridge. <laughs> That's the last thing. And speaking all the time and maybe send some inspection to the area because we have these hunters uh, or other people uh, recorded on the video, on the cameras, so we know that they were there and uh, they could be uh, pressed a little bit from the authorities that they should not do it. And there's a village near here or no, not really? It depends on the, on the crossing structure. Here there is no any village nearby. But uh, there are some local, huh, there are always people everywhere in Europe. There is no wild area waste like Yellowstone, I don't know. So you have to always consider some human presence in the area. Well, after all this, if you all do all what you can do, hopefully, hopefully, we will be able to record the videos like this on crossing structures, yeah. It's a pack of wolves on one green bridge monitored by automatic camera. One of them even has a collar. <laughs> you will see at the end. Is that heavy or? Uh, it's coming now, right now, you see. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your attention. This was my uh, road and uh, habitat fragmentation presentation. And uh, as uh, Sean said, I will show you again for those who did, didn't attend yesterday talk a little bit about the Turkish story, what we did together last year uh, regarding wolf or start of the wolf uh, research in Eastern Turkey. Start of long term research. Let's hope that it will be a long term, yeah. So the Turkey, here is the Croatia, Turkey is a much larger country and one of the, one portion of the country, this north, northeastern part is uh, kind of uh, the most remote, uh, the most, uh, let's say, I would say underdeveloped or depending uh, relative to other parts of Turkey, of course, yeah. And this is where they have wolves, well they, ha they have them also in other areas they actually don't know where else they have them in how many, but something had to be started somewhere. So they invited me to get, go there when already when I was flying to the area, I looked through the window of the plane and saw, oh, this is much different than Croatia, how we will study wolves here. 
it's almost no any forest. Uh, if there is no forest, where are wolves? Where do they live? I don't know. Well, when I landed, well, came closer to the forest, and the uh, forest is much different than the forest in Croatia. It's only pines. It's very dry. There is not so much uh, understory vegetation. Uh, There's not much place to hide. And anyway, this forest is rather small, so I was very suspicious and asking myself how this wolf would live there. What else is existing in the forest? Who else is coming? Uh, which animals? Uh, humans? How much? Uh, how often? Which time of the day? So we realized very soon that people are very much present in this forest and uh, they are everywhere. They go for logging. In spite of the forest is small, there is not much wood, but anyway they cut it, and it's all illegal cutting, and uh, officials uh, don't do much to prevent. They actually just close not one eye, but both eyes for this. But around such small patches of forest, there is a lot of livestock. I believe it used to be like this in Croatia some 50 years ago, and so, but we don't have that much livestock anymore. Here is this main source of income and main uh, way how the people live. The subsistence. subsistence, yeah. Okay. They have a lot of cows, a lot of sheep, and uh, it was really amazing to see so many animals and nothing in the forest. I mean, of wild animals. So what we did, we checked forested area and were searching for signs of a wolf presence searching for footprints, for scratches, uh, uh, markings, for scats, and we're putting this on map. We f found very, very few signs of presence of herbivores, large herbivores, like uh, roe deer. There is no red deer, just a roe deer. We found in one place only a pile of uh, roe deer droppings. And there are also some wild boar, we don't know how many. This one was dead when we saw it. So we plotted on the map these findings, and it came out that almost exclusively, almost all of them were around the forest. We were also searching in the middle of the forest here, but we didn't find any sign of a wolf. So if there are wolves, they are on the edges of the forest. Very interesting. Completely opposite of what I would expect. I would expect that they would go as deep in the forest as far as possible from humans. And we also saw some wolves, dead or alive. Like this one, which we, we saw two wolves on the edge of the forest. Sean was with me that time. Uh, just uh, resting under some big trees. And there was one alive wolf or half dead or half alive wolf brought to the veterinary faculty in cars. It had a injured or infected eye and... Um, was very bad shape, uh, exhausted, dehydrated. So we did give him a veterinary treatment, kept him for, for a while, and then freed unintentionally. Actually, the wolf escaped from the captivity. When it gets better, when it got healthy enough, it just escaped the, the enclosure, which was holding it was not good enough for, for keeping it inside. Yeah, we actually, yeah, <laughs> yeah, showed the, to the guys at the faculty that they should improve the facility, <laughs> yeah. And uh, there was also some villagers who found the uh, wolf pups in the area, and they, and they brought it to the faculty, like, to raise it in the captivity, to raise them in the captivity. And there were also some road-killed wolves, which we found, this was all happening in one month's time, so relatively short time, but kind of relatively many signs of a wolf presence in the area. And even Sean saw a wolf when he was doing his restoration work on the... Restoration wolf. Kujuk Lake? Yeah. That's yeah. a Kujuk Lake. Yeah, Kujuk. Yeah. Kujuk Lake, yeah. This, this is actually a pup, this year pup. This was October. In October they are already half year old. They have about 20 kilograms and they roam around and this pup kind of thought it will have a security in the dense brush around the lake. Maybe it came for water, who knows? Massive cover, look at all that cover. 
Yeah, the cover is <laughs> so good that even good for wolves, almost. Yeah. So anyway, we put all these observations of wolves on the map and it came out that they are all over the place, not just in this small area, the forest, which we were intensively searching for wolves, but everywhere in the area. This is called Kars Ardahan Plateau. This is a lot rather high plateau, 1,700 meters high and above. And it seems that, and by the way, this is mountain Ararat. Do you know why this mountain would be important? Ararat, yeah. This is the mountain, very high mountain in Armenia, not in Turkey, where by the Bible, uh, Noah and his ark, uh, how to say? Well, the ark supposedly came to rest. Yeah. At the end. Oh. Right. And actually, this would be the source of all biodiversity on Earth, <laughs> based, based on the Bible, right? From there, all the animals spread out around. <laughs> yeah. So, this is the study area, and wolves are all over it. And these green uh, dots would indicate where we found the wolf pups. And wherever there is a wolf pup found, this means there was a wolf pack, a reproducing wolf pack. So, there are at least Three, there was another one, uh, it was observation of uh, uh, adult wolves. There was a dead wolf pup, so at least four or even five different wolf packs we have identified in this short period of time. But how many in total lives in the area, we don't know yet. Anyway, the main reason what, why I came there and uh, uh, the main task which I was supposed to do, was to capture some wolves and put, uh, equip them with the radio collar, with the GPS collar. So to do this, we put numerous or several traps along, along, uh, around the forest. These red dots and with numbers are places where the traps for wolves were. So we had to space them to cover, let's say, area uh, points, spots where wolves were uh, found the signs of wolf presence were found. And wait, wait for, well, here we didn't wait very much, let's say, first wolf was captured uh, seven days after we started, we activated traps and the other one, 11 days. So we put the collars on them and uh, let them go back in the forest. Two wolves were collared and the first few months of tracking showed that they really moved much farther than the forest where we were searching for them and we were, were capturing them. The forest is here and it's rather small, 100 square kilometers. The biggest for bigger forest in the area is here, like 400 square kilometers, but wolves were all over the place coming to the biggest town in the area, cars and uh, around the forest and the other area. So using rather large area of plateau. The question is now, are these wolves alone or, or members of the pack? That one which was roaming almost 2,000 square kilometers wide area, most likely is alone. But the other one, which is uh, staying in much smaller area here, um, most likely is a member of the pack. So resident wolves, they don't roam that much like uh, dispersers. Dispersers search for the area and, and for, for a mate. And we will see how these things will develop and uh, what will be next year with wolves and with uh, conservation of wolves in this pa that part of the world. So the, the garbage dump is an interesting problem because the bears go there and the wolves go yeah, there. Yeah, that's another. All kinds of wildlife. And now, so that's a big famous uh, ski resort in the wintertime. Place. And so what started to happen is over the last couple of years, people have heard about this. Uh, they now go at night to the dump, and there's no gate to just drive and dump the garbage. And so people just drive up in Honda cars and regular cars that don't aren't off wheel, you know, not, not four wheel drive vehicles. And there's big bears. Right? Like one that someone shot was 300, 350 kilos, big, you know, large animals. Well, like people just walking out, doop -a -doop -a -doo, looking out, you know, watching, driving over broken glass, and just, it's, somebody's going to get killed, basically. Some 
somebody's yeah. going to get attacked, and then it, it'll then they'll want to kill all the animals. So it's a recipe for not yeah. Yeah, well, I didn't go into this, but this garbage story is definitely interesting and should be addressed. Garbage is a big problem when you think about bears. Yeah. Well, you know this about garbage and bears in North America. It's where, this is where everything started. In the, right. in the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That was the part of the Turkish story. Uh, you have any questions? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? Um, when you were speaking before in the, the first part, um, you talked about you work with the construction companies, yes. to, uh, the developers, developing all these green belts and, and all these uh, Over, Yes. How is it so receptive? It seems like they were amazingly receptive to mm -hmm. everything you did. Was yeah, it, uh, they, the people or is it mandated? They were forced. By by uh, by uh, by foreign investors, by World Bank, by uh, those who gave us a loan, who gave loans to Croatia to build the highways, so we didn't have our own money. So we, we accepted this money, but then we also accepted uh, rules and regulations by EU that we will obey, uh, we will care about the nature when we, the highways will be built. So they had to follow uh, our recommendations because otherwise. They knew we will make trouble, we will write letters, maybe to somewhere else, outside, yeah. And so it seems that they complied with just about everything you said. Yeah, yeah. Like they, they really accepted all suggestions which we recommended, yeah. So it's uh, really, and luckily, well, we were there. What if nobody would say anything? They would just build like they uh, planned to. Yes. I don't know. It's the banks. They, they, they are contracts. I, I'm not really familiar with these things. This is above my uh, reach to see what's happening up there, uh, what this, how these contracts are being made, who is contracting with whom. Uh, we were on the bottom level, this level which is doing things, uh, not deciding what will be done. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Ah, interesting. Yeah, good question. Well, it is actually much cheaper if it is done in the same way, uh, in the same time when the highway is built, when there is no traffic. And when they are building, they build all together at once. And then this price is not that much. It's, uh, let's say, for 100 meters uh, overpass, it's uh, about 2 million of euros. This would be like 3 million of dollars. <laughs> well, it looks a lot. Yeah, I, it is actually for, if we would get two millions for uh, studying uh, wolves, we could do, I don't know, miracles <laughs> with them. Every wolf could have a color or whatever. But uh, uh, if you put all together the total price of the whole highway, it's uh, like a drop in the ocean. So in, if, if it is done in the same time when the highway is contracted, it's easier. But if you have to have a separate construction later on, you decide to build the overpass already when the highway is built. It's not just a problem of uh, having a traffic under the, or you will have to have a half of the highway closed and the other half will be used, uh, the, the closed high, half will be under the construction and then you, when you build the half, then you have to move to another half and so. It's also a problem of the perception. People then see this as a, some additional, some extra cost they think, why do we need to spend two millions or three millions of euros to build 100 meters overpass? Is it so important or not? Why should we do this? We could, uh, let's say, in, in that time when these overpasses were built in Croatia, we, this was just after the war, and somebody could say, oh, we could build so many houses for homeless people or I don't know what else. But uh, somehow it was hidden in the total price of the highway and uh, there was no complaints about that. So if you have an additional project, you know, somebody will, Sean will get the idea to build a overpass over here and there, yeah? That will be probably much more difficult to convince people to get the money just for this than if it would be, have been done 
earlier together with the highways which already exist for a long time. Unless people be a, be the splatter spotter for many years, uh -huh. they're really worried about the warm, fuzzy animals that get killed. Yeah. They're just kind of a constituency that says we don't want to see animals killed. Yeah. It depends on the perception, yeah. Cool, other okay. questions?